What you're looking at right now is called Ricci flow with surgery. It changes the curvature of manifolds in four-dimensional space. You may have heard of it because it was used to crack a $1 million problem in topology called the Poincaré conjecture. And by the end of this video, you'll understand exactly what it is. The agenda for today is to understand the conjecture and how Ricci flow was used to solve it. Along the way, we'll pick up some Riemannian geometry and surgery theory. And with these, we'll have the proof that Terence Tao called one of the most impressive recent achievements of modern mathematics. The Poincaré conjecture says this. Suppose you have a blob sitting inside four-dimensional space. If the blob has no holes, so not like this or like this, and if it's in one piece, so not like this or like this, then you can mold the blob into a sphere. In formal terms, any closed three-manifold that is path-connected and where every loop is contractible to a point is homeomorphic to the three-sphere. A manifold is just a surface in higher dimensional space. A three manifold is a surface that locally looks three dimensional. This is our blob. Path connected means that you can connect any two points with a path. This means that you can squish any loop in the space to a point. This means that you can mold the blob into a sphere sitting inside four dimensional space. Here's a question, who cares? Well, it has legendary status because it sounds easy. For example, these are all terms that you should learn in a first course in topology, but nobody's been able to crack it for over a hundred years. Worse still, in every other dimension, this problem was solved. The n equals 4 case was particularly hard, so Michael Friedman won the 1986 Fields Medal for cracking it. But for some reason, the n equals 3 case was impossible. It was solved in 2002. Russian mathematician Grisha Perelman posted three papers on the archive. They were rich in ideas, but frugal with details. Now, this is going to get really abstract really fast, so hold on tight. Riemannian geometry studies size and curvature. It does so with a gadget called the metric tensor, G. This thing takes a tangent vector to the manifold and assigns it a length. So maybe this arrow has length 2 and this arrow has length 5. Note, the arrow has no intrinsic length, it's an abstract object. We're just giving it a length of our own choosing. The metric tensor has a nice intuitive picture. Imagine tying a shoelace through a point. If we assign really small lengths to tangent vectors, it's like pulling in the shoelace. If we assign really large lengths, it's like relaxing the shoelace. The metric tensor tells the manifold where to shrink and where to expand. But if you've noticed, we've also told the manifold how to curve. And that's the amazing thing about the metric tensor. By encoding size, it gives you curvature. This brings us to the second player of Riemannian geometry, the Ricci curvature. This object tells you exactly how the manifold curves, all in terms of G. Now, full disclosure, the exact formula for the Ricci curvature is a little unwieldy. That shouldn't be a surprise. This curvature is quite complicated. But the point is, if you know G, you know R. Now we're ready to apply these. Ricci flow is a way of changing the metric tensor over time so that the manifold becomes rounder. So how do we express Ricci flow concretely? I want you to focus on this region over here. The Ricci flow inflates it like a balloon. By convention, we say that it has negative Ricci curvature. So if the curvature is negative, the length increases. Now focus on this region here. Ricci flow deflates it. So if the Ricci curvature is positive, the length decreases. We can phrase this differently. G decreases 
means the derivative of g is negative. g increases just means the derivative of g is positive. These two guys always have opposite signs, so we might guess an equation like this. And that's it! That is the equation describing Ricci flow. As tradition, we put a 2 on this side, because that's what the inventor of Ricci flow did, and it just kind of stuck. But the meaning is unchanged. With this, we can understand something crucial to cracking the Poincaré. Ricci flow squishes a sphere to nothingness. A sphere has positive curvature everywhere. So the derivative of g is negative. So the net trick keeps decreasing forever until it hits zero. Perelman also showed that the opposite was true. If the metric went to zero, the last shape you had must have been a sphere. Here's how we use this to solve the Poincaré. Take a random manifold and give it an arbitrary metric g, and see how it changes with Ricci flow. If you can prove the metric will go to zero in finite time, that means the last shape you had must have been a sphere. But changing the metric doesn't change the underlying manifold. So if you ended up with a sphere, you must have started with something homeomorphic to a sphere. This argument is beautiful, but it hits a snag. You see, in higher dimensions, you can have situations like this, where a point in this neck gets squished to nothing even before the manifold becomes a sphere. This is a problem. If Ricci flow deletes parts of your manifold, you're changing the underlying set. It's game over. Another singularity you might see, a neck with a cap. A Ricci flow could stretch this out and squeeze this point into nothingness. You could also have more complicated snags, like the Bryant soliton, where some of the points in the manifold mysteriously vanish. To deal with these singularities, Perelman came up with a strategy. Perelman decided to manually remove the problem areas of the manifold. He then glued pieces of spheres to cover the holes that he had made. Here's how he used it to prove the Poincaré. Play out your Ricci flow with surgery and prove that it'll go extinct. Now hit the rewind button. First, you'll see the creation of spheres. Then, you'll see the creation of necks. At each time, you only see the creation of spheres and necks. But two spheres connected by a neck is just a sphere. So at each time, the manifold is a collection of spheres. But the manifold we started off with was connected. So it must have been a sphere. Say what you want, but this argument is just beautiful. And it proves the Poincaré conjecture, making it one of the greatest triumphs.